you, Jake. And ladies, if you would this morning, turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. And um, before we go to the word, let's take a moment to pray one more time. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would breathe your breath of life upon this message, Lord. Lord, that you would be our teacher this morning, that your Holy Spirit would instruct us. Lord, we want to hear from you, not the opinions or uh, sayings of men, rather, but what you would have for us this morning, Lord, that this seed would fall on good soil and produce fruit, 30, 60, and even 100-fold, Lord. We ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, it, it never ceases to amaze me in, in, um, in this morning being one of those where it just seems how everything, there's a constant theme of the service. You know, we, we sing the song, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. And, and Jay talks about the atonement in, in, in communion and how this is the only way in which we can have fellowship and communion with God is through the blood of Jesus. And um, it, it's one of those things where uh, <laughs> I, I know I, I just had a feeling I was praying to God and I said, you know, it may just be my flesh, but you know, we've been in the New Testament a lot. And I was like, God, I really want to get, you know, selfishly, maybe it is, you know, but God gives us the desires of our heart, right? I just got to really would like to move back to the Old Testament. And, 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 and God gave me um, a, I believe, what God would have for us this morning. And, and it's interesting, too, that um, whenever I go back, and, and it's hard for me to jump in the middle of something. You know, in Exodus, we, we're going to talk about Exodus 25 and, and how, and maybe for God, Lord willing for the next few messages on Sunday morning, go through the tabernacle. And I, I, how interesting it is how God shows us the Messiah and who he's going to be through the tabernacle. All these Old Testament um, uh ceremonies and rites and, and we've gone through the feasts and how you can see Christ in the feasts but you know even in the tabernacle and the way the tabernacle was built and the ceremonies that they had in the tabernacle those all point to the Messiah now we're on the back end of that how we can see how Christ fulfilled all of those um, those typologies and those shadows and fulfilled all those of, of what God instituted for there. And he did that so in the hopes that his people, right, Israel, would not miss it when the Messiah came. Because all the things that, the, the, that Jesus did, and even the things that he said, should have alerted the priests and the scribes and, every, and the Pharisees too. Wait, only the Messiah was supposed to do that. This guy can't be the Messiah. Well, no, he was, and they missed it. That's why, you know, it's, it, Jesus says, and for this reason, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to those who produce fruit. So in, in wanting to go through the, um, the tabernacle, it's hard for me to jump right in at the tabernacle. And I, I kept wanting to go back and, well, we have to do the whole Exodus story, right? I mean, that's how you get to the tabernacle. And God's like, no, just do what I tell you to, okay? I know sometimes you're a little slow, but just do where I want you to, just talk about what I want you to talk about. And, and it's that theme, right, where, where Jesus had said, no man comes to the Father except through me. And that doesn't mean, when Jesus said that, he didn't mean from that point forward. He didn't mean, okay, from, from now on, right, no one comes to the Father except through me. He said, no, no, no man comes to the Father. That meant Old Testament too. They did not, they, they have no way of going to Christ other than, or going to God other than the blood of Christ. That's the only, just as we sang this morning, that's the only atoning sacrifice. 
And that's the only way through which. And, and God planned it that way, and he showed Israel that that was going to be the way that they do it. So when Israel comes out of Egypt, right, I'm going to give a little bit of a background, kind of a synopsis to catch us up to where we're at. Um, God gave them a way to meet with him. And it was through the tabernacle. Because prior to this, um, Moses would meet with him in the tent of meeting, and the tent of meeting eventually gets moved and modeled into the tabernacle. Or he would meet with him on the mountaintop. And so when God makes a way, he says, I'll make a way to come to the people. Make a way to be with the people. And in Hebrews 5, 8, 5, it says, it, um, well, the author, I believe, is Paul. He's talking about the, the priests that serve right in the temple. They served a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for, see, he says, or God says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. So God is the one that says, you'll build this the way that I told you to build it, right? But the author of Hebrews, Paul's saying, but remember, that's just a foreshadow of heavenly things. It's a, an earthly representation of heavenly realities, right? It's a, this is what the temple and the tabernacle were. So to, to catch up to Exodus 24, 25, See, Israel was enslaved in Egypt. So Moses, um, uses, Moses is called by God to be used to deliver the people from Israel. So then you have the ten plagues. You have the institute of some of the feasts with the Passover and unleavened bread. God leads his people out of Egypt. And then the parting of the Red Sea. And you have um, Pharaoh's armies try to follow, and they get swallowed up. So Israel's come to the wilderness, and God provides water, manna, and meat for them while they're in the wilderness. And then Israel fights with Amalek, and this is the story when Aaron and Hur uphold uh, Moses' hands. Because while <laughs> Moses upholds his hands, the people are prevailing, but when he gets tired and lets them down, then Israel starts to lose in the battle, so then they have to hold his hands up. So now Moses, and then, and then where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments and a lot of the laws that are to govern Israel and how they're to worship God and follow after and conduct themselves, right? So now we come up, now we're caught up. That's the synopsis of the first 24 chapters. The first 23, now we're up to chapter 24, right? So Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, along with 70 of the elders of Israel, are to go up to the mountain and they're going to affirm this covenant that God wants to make with the people of Israel. Now, an important little note here is when you see 70, that's to, that's to remind you of the, the table of nations that's in Genesis 10. Okay, now why, why, does, why do you have to have 70 elders that come? Remember, Israel's, the point Israel was supposed to be is the priesthood to all the world, right? They were supposed to take the message of the Messiah and the forgiveness of sins to the entire world, right? Now, while Israel is still God's chosen people, it was his plan all along that all the world would be redeemed through Israel and through the Messiah. This wasn't just something that God did solely for Israel. No, he's telling them, listen, by, the, by having them bring 70 elders, what he's saying is, I'm going to make this covenant with you, Israel. But... You are to go to all the nations and take this message. It's for all people, not just for you. So Moses builds an altar and they offer up burnt offerings and sacrifices of peace offerings. And Moses catches half the blood in basins and the other half he sprinkles on the altar that he's built. Now the part that he caught in the basins, he goes to the people and they say, well, you serve God the way he wants you to. And they say, yeah, we're going to. And he sprinkles them with blood. Now what they would do at this time, it was called, um, what they would, when you made a covenant, it was called cutting a covenant. And what you would do is you would take the animals that you, you, you make a pact, and you take animals and you cut them in two, and you separate them. And as the blood that flows into the middle, you and whoever you're making the covenant with would walk through the middle of these 
dissected animals. And what you were saying is if I break this covenant, may the same thing that happened to these animals happen to me. May I be done away with just the way we did these animals. So, and, and so blood was part of their covenants. So which makes sense, right? Our, our covenant with God can only be made with blood. So he, he sprinkles the people and they say, yep, we're, we're going to do what God wants us to do. And it's the same way. We can't even go to God, right? This is a continual theme throughout the entire Bible. There's no way you can go to God unless it's through blood. It's the only way. The shedding of blood is the only way for the remission of sins. It's only through a bloody sacrifice that we can be rectified with God. We can have any relationship with him. Exodus 24, 8 says, So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And then once they... Uh, once they would go through, once they would go through this and cut the covenant, then they would share a meal together, which is what they do in that chapter. It says they go up, they go up to the foot of the mountain and they have a meal. Now Moses goes up there and he's hanging out at the bottom of the mountain for six days, and on the seventh day, God calls Moses to come up to the mountain. And this is where Moses stays there for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says elsewhere that he didn't eat any bread or drink any water while he was up there for 40 days. I mean, this is how close Moses' communion was with God. This is, man shall not live by bread alone, but every, every word that comes out of the mouth of God, right? And it would say that Moses would talk to God as friends talk. Now, it didn't mean that Moses was friendly with God. You know, he didn't go up to God and give him knuckles or whatever he was doing, right? It, it wasn't a familiar in that sense. But what it meant was that he would talk face to face with God. He, he, Moses and God would have conversations back and forth. I mean, if you're in that close of communion with God, you don't need anything worldly, right? You don't need anything the world has to offer you because you've got everything that you need in that close communion with God. So God gives Moses, gives him the Ten Commandments, instructs him on how he's supposed to build the tabernacle for God. That's where we pick it up in, in um, 25. So we're going to go through the first 22. I'm going to read the first 22 verses. And this is what we'll look at closer. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me for every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you shall raise from them, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, porpoise skins. A porpoise is like, what it means is like an otter or a seal. Acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod, for the breastplate. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Now this is the key to this whole thing, right? Why, why is he doing this? They're constructing, constructing the sanctuary that God would dwell among them. According to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. And they shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four rings for it and fasten them onto its feet, and the two rings shall be on one side of it and two on the other side of it. I mean, he goes into detail, right? This is how I want you to make it. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. And the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be removed from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide. 
And you shall make two cherubim of, cherubim of gold. Make them out of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim will be turned down towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat at the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat and between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in, commanding, in commandment for the sons of Israel. So it starts out that God tells Moses to take a free will offering. Right? For those that have a heart to give. He starts off with this, right? I only want those involved that have a heart according to what I want. He doesn't go to Israel and say, okay, every tribe, we're going to divide this up. Everybody has to give their fair share. Everybody has to give 10%. No, this is for the building of the tabernacle. And he says, I only want those who have a heart for serving me to give anything towards towards this and they're supposed to give gold silver bronze purple scarlet cloth fine linens goat's hair ram skins acacia wood oil spices and precious stones and you think well where did this where did this slave nation get all this stuff from well you go back to exodus 12 right this is always the the danger of jumping right in in the middle of the story like, well, where did these guys get all this stuff they're wandering around well back in exodus 12 Verse 35, it says you, Moses, they did what Moses said to do, and they went to Pharaoh and said, hey, you need to give us a bunch of fine linen and gold and all this other stuff. And Pharaoh said, yeah, sure, here you go. And, and it says that they plundered Egypt on their way out. It's a, a way, really, of God making good on all the slave years that they spent in Egypt. They collected all their wages at the end. So they're to build this tabernacle so that God may dwell among them. See, God could not just live in the midst of his people. He would destroy them. If you go back and, and read about Korah's rebellion, right, God goes to him and says, listen, get away, Moses, Aaron, just get away from him. I'm going to wipe him out. He said, I don't want you down there, right? And, and Moses and Aaron intercede. And as the plague is coming through, as the plague is coming through in these rebellious people, they go out with the incense, which is, which is to show the prayers that they offered up to God on their behalf. And it stops the plague. Right? But God was ready. He was going to wipe them all out if it hadn't been for Moses and Aaron. So God can't just come in his holiness and dwell among an unholy people. There has to be a way to make that possible. He has the way to make it possible, but he can't just come live there, right? There has to be parameters. There has to be things in place to make this possible. And, and he says it, right? You're supposed to build this tabernacle just as I have told you to. Now, see, this is God's plan, not man. And he didn't just tell man, oh, hey, just, I don't know, put, put up some stuff and it'll be okay. You know, whatever you, whatever you think's appropriate. Right? And, and that, even in that, is a microcosm for our own lives. You can't go to God on your own terms. You can't think that, oh, I can just live my life however I want to. God's love, right? He, he loves me. He doesn't care. All these rules, like that's all old stuff. I don't have to pay any attention to that, right? I mean, I love him, so it doesn't matter. No, no, no. God set specific parameters in place. It says, if you want to approach me, this is the process, right? You can't just go to God however you want to. It's not up to you. God has put the plan in place, not man. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand 
of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Right? He's saying, listen, man just didn't construct this thing. Even though it was just a shadow of what's real, it's God that pitched this tabernacle. Jesus said, no man, like we started out, right? No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way we approach God. So therefore, it makes sense that the tabernacle would reflect who Jesus was. Because that was the way Israel was to approach God, was through the tabernacle. Matthew 1.23 said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Even Jesus coming to the earth had to come in a form that made it possible for him to dwell among men. John says this, 114, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that dwell, right? I mean, we've talked about this before, but when it means dwell, it means to tabernacle. He, John uses this term. And he uses it so we remember that God is dwelling with us. John goes on later on in Revelation 21, 3 to say, And I heard a loud voice, this is part of his vision, from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. The whole point of both the tabernacle and the incarnation is so that God can be with us. That he might save us from our sins. Might make it possible for us to approach God. Now, what's interesting about <laughs> when I started looking at this stuff, right? It's when we describe a building or when we describe how something looks, we usually start with the exterior and move to the interior. But that's not the way God starts. God starts with the interior and moves to the exterior. Because in the tabernacle, what's in the interior, what's in the Holy of Holies, is the most important part. So that's what God starts with and says, no, what's at the innermost is what's most important. And I think it's the same thing with us. God doesn't isn't worried about, doesn't begin with the exterior, so you have to clean up the exterior and then move to the interior. God says, no, no, let's begin on the interior. Let's start with your heart. Then we'll move to the exterior. He builds from the inside out. Now we get to the ark itself. Now it says that the ark is to be made of acacia wood. Now, the acacia tree was something that grew in abundance there when they were in the wilderness, but it's a very thorny tree. Maybe sometime look it up, right? Google it, the acacia tree. You'll see it has these long, long thorns on it. And many say that it's, that's likely the tree that they used to make the crown of thorns that they placed on Jesus at his crucifixion. Now, the thorns repre represent the curse that was brought on the earth by the fall of men. So God uses this cursed wood and he overlays it with gold. And it's covered up by something better. Now the entire inner sanctuary of the tabernacle was covered in gold. When you go into it, the whole thing, everything's gold. Everything's made of gold. Everything's covered in gold. We have to remember that the tabernacle and the temple are shadows of the reality of what heaven is like. Now in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. It means that there's untold treasures in heaven. Because the most precious metal that we have here on this earth is used as pavement in heaven. It's like the least of their concerns. The thing that we hold most dear, that we say is most expensive, heaven's like, well, yeah, that's like the least expensive thing that we have up here. 
And if you think of it too, we, we talked about the parable of the pearls. The one thing that come up when I was looking at that is, you know, the pearls are so big in heaven that one, the gates through which you enter is one solid pearl. That's a big pearl. So all this gold, right, is to make you think of the throne room of God. So we have an object, right, of the curse that's redeemed for the use in the presence of God. But what does he say? It has to be covered inside and out. And in one respect, we have been made into the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Christ dwells in us just as God dwells in us. So our cursed bodies have been covered and made from something corruptible into something incorruptible. The curse that we bear has been made righteous through Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, right? I'm not saying we're the ark. Now, this acacia wood is going to be used throughout the whole of the temple, right? So I'm not, I don't want to draw this parallel, but this is the thing where God, God uses what has been cursed. And he can take it and change it and mold it and cover it and use it something for his glory. So who's the ark? Now, I remember talking to a group of young teenagers, and, and I was kind of going over with them what we talked about last Sunday in these, right? This is the problem with humanistic religion and humanistic Christianity, is that we always want to put ourselves into the story, right? You hear preachers that say, David and Goliath, well, if you just rely on God, you can slay giants, right? No, you can't. That's not the point of David, right? You're not David. You're never meant to be David. David is Christ. There's only one who can slay sin, yes. okay? And it's the same thing with the treasure and the pearls. We want to say, oh, look, we're the one that gave up everything so that we can get the treasure. No, no, you're not. Christ gave up everything to purchase you. That's your worth. That's how much you're worth, right? And it's the same thing here. Even though the theme holds true for the tabernacle as a whole, that this cursed acacia wood is used by God for something to glorify him, right? You're not the ark, okay? You're not the, you're not the ark. So who is the ark? When he, what does he say, right? We've got to look at what he says here. Moses says that it's the one who, or God tells Moses, it's the how is the testimony which God has given to Moses. Well, this testimony is the Ten Commandments. Now, the, the testimony that, that God is talking about here is not the way many times we think of a testimony, right? If we want to give a testimony about the goodness of God, that's not what it means. The Ten Commandments were actually a testimony against man. You can't keep the law. God set forth the law. And you can't keep it. And the thing about it is, is that, right, you can't just say, oh, you know, I keep some of the law, some of it I don't, I'm working on it. No, the whole point is, if you break one of the commandments, you've broken the whole of the law. And this is when the rich young ruler, right, he comes to Jesus and he says, you know, what must I do to be saved? He says, you know, keep the commandments. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, all of those I've kept since I was a young man. And I tell people, well, right there, you're not supposed to bear false witness, right? Because I've never known a single kid that ever kept the whole of the law, never lied, stealed, stole, stealed, stealed, right? It's a word in Nebraska, don't worry. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, the, the, the guy right there starts off as a liar. But God says, you know, hey, just go sell everything and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And it says he goes away sad. Why? Because God, he says, listen, you can keep maybe the second tablet, how you deal with men. Let's just, I'll give you that. How about the first tablet? How about having no gods before me? He showed him that you, you have something more important in your life than me. 
So the law is a testimony against man. Now, so remember, this goes in the ark. This is what, the ark is just basically the chest, right? The box that he builds to put all this stuff in there. So the first thing that goes in is, is the testimony, right? The Ten Commandments. Now, remember that those are a copy of the Ten Commandments, the second copy, because Moses breaks the first one. When he comes down from the mountain and he sees the golden calf, and that's another sermon for another time, and he throws them down and, he, and, and shatters the, the first tablet to show them as a testimony against Israel, look, you already broke all the law. So he takes the second tablet and puts them in there. So the law stands as the testimony for the righteousness of God and against the unrighteousness of man. And Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill the law. In Jesus, the whole of the law and the righteousness, he was able to fulfill the demands of God. Now these righteous demands of the law, right, they bring the realization of sin. While they condemn man by telling him what he should be, the law does not have the power to give man the ability to fulfill it. That has to come somewhere else. You know, and, and Paul talks about this, right? He's talking about what the law does. In Romans 7, verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except for the law. For I would have not known about coveting if the law had said... You shall not covet. So he's saying, no, the law points out the sin in my life. Makes me realize that I have sin in my life. He continues in verse 13. He says, therefore, did that which is good become a cause for death? He's saying, no, the law is good. So he's saying, but did good bring death? And he says, no, may it, rather, may it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. So that through the commandments, sin would become utter, utterly sinful. How does sin become utterly sinful? Like he's just saying, listen, the only reason I knew I was dead is because the good law of God showed me that I'm a sinful person. And how bad is my sin? It's utterly sinful. I mean, that's something that we don't, talk about many times, right? The sin, how sinful sin really is. The other thing that would come to be placed in the ark is that they would have a golden vessel filled with manna. Now this is the only manna ever to not go bad. If, if they tried to save manna for the next day, you could, you could do it on Friday, so you could have some for the Sabbath, so you didn't have to go. That was the only one that would last at least 24 hours. But any other manna, if you tried to save it, it would get worms. So they, they couldn't build it up, right? But not this manna. This manna that they put in the ark never went bad. So this bread is forever. It was incorruptible. John 6.35, Jesus says that I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will not go hungry. Now we've talked about that before and we, we've been over that so I won't rehash much of that. But we can see how Christ's body, Christ, having manna in the ark is pointing towards the true bread of life that would come. And you don't have to say it out loud, but pop quiz, what's the third art item that's put in the ark? Aaron's staff. Aaron's budded staff, right? That, that, that comes from number 17. The short story is there that the people were grumbling against Moses and Aaron. And in order to stop their grumbling, right, God says, tell you what, Moses, this is what we're going to do. So the people know who's in charge. Who I pick, right? Who I've picked to serve me. I want you all to have each one of the tribes bring a staff, put their names on it. But I want you to put Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. And you're going to leave them in the 
the tent of meeting overnight, and in the morning you'll know who I picked. So they come in the next morning, <laughs> Moses comes in, and there's Aaron's staff, which not only has it budded, but it says it has ripe almonds on it. Now the almond tree is the first of the, the fruiting trees, right, to produce blossoms and produce fruit. And if I remember right, I'm pretty sure the almond tree actually produces flowers before it ever produces leaves. I might be wrong about that, but I, I think that's the way it goes. But it's the first one of the, of the spring to produce flowers. And what's even more amazing about that is, is that the almond tree is not a self-pollinating tree. It has to be pollinated. Pollinators don't work at night. They only work during the day. So not only is it a miracle that this dead thing comes to life and produces fruit at night, but every aspect of this is a miracle. So the dead stick produces fruit. Now why is it? What does God tell Aaron, right? What does God tell Aaron after this? So the, if you go to Numbers 18, you can go there on your own. So, but it says, so the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt in connection with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt in connection with your priesthood. What is Aaron? He says, Aaron, I picked you, but why did I pick you? So that you will bear the guilt of your people. You will bear the guilt of the nation. From death was brought life. God placed his blessing on the dead branch and brought life from it. That the branch was, br was brought to life in connection with the bearing of the guilt of the people. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was the first fruits of the grave. From the death of Jesus, we are brought to life. And he bore our guilt. So there's this aspect of all three of these things. The testimony against man, the bread of life, the, the dead stick that brings life. Or all what are placed in this ark. Now the part of the acacia wood that's covered by the gold, right, just to go back to that for a little bit now, this also speaks of the two natures of Christ. He's both man and divine. So both are used to make this ark. What I thought about when, when you go out and move on to the rings, right? And he says, you're going to make these poles and you're going to put them in the rings. And he says, now... And don't take the poles out. Leave the poles there the entire time. Because man was not supposed to touch the ark. Right? There's a story of that. The ark goes to fall, and he reaches out, and he touches it, because he's going to steady it, right? I mean, it seems like the good thing to do. Like, we can't let it hit the ground. So he reaches out to, to steady it, and as soon as he touches it, he dies. And you think, well, God, I mean, he's just trying to keep it from touching the ground. No, don't. We can never suppose, even presuppose, that we're good enough to approach God. I don't care what the circumstances are. That's why he says, don't pull the poles out. Once they're in there, they're to stay there. That conduit between man and God, where man is moving, this whole thing's supposed to be mobile, right? But there has to be a barrier. There has to be a conduit between man and God. You can't even, I don't care what happens to the ark, don't touch it. You can't, God has no, God has no way to come in connection with sinful man and man to survive. So on the top of the ark, right? He says, I want you to build a lid. Now this lid is made out of solid gold. This is one piece. And it has two cherub angels that surround the mercy seat. Now remember that everything that's gold, that, that, 
that God is instructing Moses to put into this tabernacle. This is the shadow of realities that are going on in heaven. Now there's constantly angels around the throne room in heaven. They're constantly flying, ready to go and do God's will. But the other part that we see where cherubs are is that the cherubs were the ones who were placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden to keep man out after he fell so that he wouldn't come back in and have access to the tree of life. So they're, they're there to keep man from approaching something that they've been cut off from. I think these cherub were there to remind man that they're in a broken state. And you can only approach God through his mercy. And that's why the angels are part of the mercy seat, right? They're not added to the mercy seat. They're not made separately. He says, I want you to take one solid gold piece and you're going to hammer it out, right? You're going to shape this one piece so that these cherubs have their wings covering the mercy seat and they're looking down at the mercy seat. Now, we don't want to say then that the angels have a part in bringing mercy to man, right? That's only God. But God's vengeance is part of mercy. You can't have mercy unless you stand condemned before the judge. I think that's why the, the, that's the point of the cherubs being over the mercy seat. Is listen, this is where God dwells. But remember, you've been cut off. You can't approach God. Be careful of what you're doing. Remember that there's a vengeful God that you're going to come and meet. And there's that barrier that's still between man and God. Now God says that this is where he would meet man. This becomes the throne of God on earth. Now all pagan worshipers would put an idol in this place, right? We've got to put, this is where our God goes. We're going to put our God here. But God says, no, you're going to leave that place empty. Because I'll come down myself and meet the people. And there was only one thing that was supposed to touch the mercy seat, and that was only once a year. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat for the sacrifice of atonement. And the story goes is that they would, <laughs> they would tie a rope to the high priest when he would go in there. Because if he was struck dead because he approached God unworthily, they weren't about to go in there and get him. So they would pull him back out with the rope. Because they're like, if, if the high priest gets killed, we're not about to go in there. But that was the only time that they were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Was that one time a year to sprinkle it with blood. And the atoning blood is the only thing that could touch the mercy seat. So the mercy seat would cover the broken law and keep it de from delivering its vengeance on man. There had to be something between the broken law and man. And that thing that covered it could only be pure. And it was only one. One pure lid covered the testimony against man. The Timothy 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, it says, For there is only one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all and the testimony given at the proper time. This, this whole thing that God instructs Moses to build and to have built the ark that sits in the Holy of Holies, the one that serves as a place for man to go 
and meet God. Every bit of it, every bit of it is made and put there so that Israel would recognize the Messiah when they came, when he came. Now we know that they didn't, right? But now that we can look back and take all that we said to Jesus, right? We see more clearly than they did then that Jesus is our mercy seat. Jesus is the only way that we can go to God. And it's not this idea that the world says, well, you know, there's many different ways to God and everyone's the same and everyone does this and, and all the other lies that the world wants to tell you. Because God said from the very beginning, this is the only way you approach me. It's only through mercy covered in the blood of a perfect lamb can you have communion with the Father. So Lord willing, we'll go through the other, all the other, <laughs> it gets, I, I, hopefully you guys think this stuff's interesting. I think this stuff's interesting. That he, the way in which God had put all this stuff into place so that we can see Christ and everything that he had from the very beginning. He's our only way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this service, Lord. I thank you for everyone who's here, everyone willing to brave the, the cold and, and the, the ice and everything else, Lord. For, Lord, we want to be in the house of God. We want to be here to meet you. And, Lord, we know and we thank you that you sent your son to become man so that he might take our place that he might be our atoning sacrifice, that he might be the blood for us sprinkled on the mercy seat that we might have communion with the Father. And Lord, we thank you for sending your son to do that. And Lord, be with us as we go from here. Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart for the lost, that we might take this message of forgiveness and a Messiah that died in our place, that we would take that message to a fallen and sin-sick world, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.